Well, salutation, saints. It's good to be with you this morning. And I'm just going to say this in faith and uh, prophecy that spring is here. Anybody agree with that? How many have enjoyed the 62 degree weather and the vitamin D? I love grass. It doesn't matter if it's brown and soggy. It is better than snow. And the Lord agrees with me. In the creation story, it didn't say, and on the third day, God created snow. No, absolutely not. It said he created grass and trees and bushes and everything green. And so how many are like me and you are fully ready and embracing spring and all the goodness that it brings? Come on. Well, that has nothing to do with my message, but we are in Romans chapter 12. We're continuing in our series. We're going to be in here for the next two weeks, both in the morning and in the evening. So you can turn there in your Bibles, Romans 12. This past Wednesday was our first week back with midweek services. And if you were in the building, there was a little bit of a buzz and excitement in the air. It was nice to see so many different people. I loved that my kindergartner, Sam, he was one of 11 kindergartners in their class being discipled at a kindergarten level. And I love it. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anybody who has guardianship or anything over a child, get your kids on Wednesday nights. We want to help you in discipleship discipling your kids, and uh, it's a partnership that we do that, and at the same time, you can join in one of our classes or a small group, um, and it's important to go deeper in God's Word and general theology. We are going to be reading the first two verses in Romans chapter 12. There's a lot of good stuff, but the first word that Paul uses is therefore, which simply means what I'm about ready to say correlates with what I have just finished saying. Chapter 12 is a hinge point for the book of Romans. Paul, time and time again in his letters, in his epistles, he says, in view of this, or in view of that, which tells me that understanding theology is very important. A lot of people want to skip to the why and get straight to the what. Just tell me what to do. I don't un- need to understand why I'm doing it. And I refuse to preach a gospel only telling you what to do. That's why Pastor August did an awesome job unpacking chapter 11 last week so that we can understand chapter 12 this week. Theology informs and supports ethics. And true discipleship involves understanding why we do what we do. The first 11 chapters of Romans have discussed so much of what God has done for us. And now Paul has just finished explaining God's plan of salvation. And now in chapter 12 is the hinge point of the book of Romans. Would you stand with me as we read these first two verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says this, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in other words, in view of chapters 1 through 11, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Heavenly Father, this morning, I just pray that you would speak through me exactly what needs to be said in this service for everyone here in this building, over in the mask on, watching online, that you would have reins of my words in my tongue this morning, and at the same time, you would... Uh, Just take the reins of our minds and our hearts, and they would be open for what your spirit is going to speak to us. And so, God, we are ready to receive from you, and I pray that your spirit, as it speaks, it would also equip us to follow through in this word and this message from you. So continue to work in my life, in our lives, as a church, as a whole. And every person said, Amen. amen. You can find your seats, 930. So Paul comes to this conclusion. In view of God's mercy, in view of the salvation offered to us through Jesus Christ, this is how you should live, to offer your lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing 
to God. For this is proper worship. I believe that when Paul instructs his readers to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, he is trying to draw a parallel and paint a bigger picture than just saying, hey, you're living and you're physically alive and you are willing to do the work of God. When reading scripture, it's important to not just focus directly on the immediate passage and just the immediate verses. That's called reductionism. We need to zoom out a little bit and read these verses in context of the chapter and then zoom out a little bit further and read it in context of the book and then zoom out even further where we get to see how it relates to the entire story of the Bible. And, and so this morning, how does Romans 12, 1 and 2 relates to the Old Testament. Well, let's take a brief look at Old Testament sacrifices and we might be able to understand what Paul is talking about. When an individual would bring a sin offering in the Old Testament, they were instructed to bring a female lamb or a female goat. Now, when I uh, asked my youngest daughter, Essie, if I could borrow her lamb, tomorrow for my sermon, she says, no, you cannot. And I said, but I need to sacrifice it in my sermon. She goes, okay, daddy. So this is, uh, this is our female lamb. So as you bring your, your sin offering, you'd bring a, a female lamb or a goat. If you're too poor and you couldn't afford an entire lamb, you could have a bird or some smaller. And if you're even the poorest of poor, they would allow for grain or flour offerings. And you would bring this lamb and you'd bring it to the altar and you'd meet the priest down at the altar. And you would tie this animal up and you'd lay it on the altar and you would place your hand on the lamb's head and you'd begin to confess your sins. You begin to confess your shortcomings, your transgressions, and you would, you would confess everything as if you were placing your sin and transferring it symbolically to this lamb. And while you're holding this animal down, the priest then would kill the animal and sacrifice the animal. It was a very gory and gru uh, gruesome scene and there was blood everywhere. And so you're asking, how does this relate now? Well, instead of bringing a lamb to the altar, Paul is saying, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, and we become the sacrifice. And we don't bring our sacrifice to an earthly priest. We bring it to the one true high priest, Jesus Christ. And, and, and in this, I just dropped a whole bunch of papers. Thanks, Pastor Kerry. <laughs> um, nobody understands that because Pastor Kerry and I had papers up here. Uh, in, in this moment, we present our lives uh, at the altar and Jesus comes and meets us. It's important to understand that Old Testament sacrifices were a synergistic work. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say synergistic. Okay, what does synergistic mean? It means it takes the cooperation of two individuals. It took the cooperation of the person offering the sacrifice and the cooperation of the priest to finish the sacrifice. In the same way, when we go to the altar and we present our lives before Jesus Christ and say, here I am, it is a synergistic work. There is a cooperation that happens. We don't just say, here I am, God, do your work. It's all on you and walk away. That would make it a monogistic work. In the same way, there is a partnership between the priest and the individual offering the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Being a living sacrifice today is a partnership between us and Jesus. When you present your life and say, here I am, God, Jesus might begin to speak to you and say, okay, I've got some work for you to do. Let's start with the influences in your life. While I care about and I love your drinking buddies, right now I need you to make some godly buddies. Thursday nights are no longer gonna be for the bar, they're gonna be for your family. Tuesday nights are no longer catch up on Netflix night, they're Bible study night, they're small group night. And Jesus begins to speak to us, hey, you need to leave your laptop at home or at, at work and not bring it home because you don't need that temptation in your household. And, and, and there's things that God begins to speak to us so that it becomes a cooperation so that we can kill the things in our lives that need to be killed. 
being a living sacrifice involves a partnership and it involves work on your end. And as we are faithful to do the work on our end, you can guarantee that Christ is faithful in doing the work on his end because he is the only one that can forgive you of your sin. He's the only one that can rid you of your sin and he's the only one that can change your sinful desires. And he does this through a process, a lifelong process called sanctification, the process of becoming holy. And these two verses, verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12, these are every bit as important for the long-time believer, the old believer, as it is for the new believer. Let us not forget what Christ has done. Let us, in, in view of God's mercy, in view of his salvation, let's look back and understand what has taken place so that today I don't have to make an emotional decision. I can stand on understanding and theology and say, I am going to kill the things in my life that need to be killed and get rid of them. Your process is not complete. 60, 70, 80 year old, listen to me. You might be pretty holy. You might have walked with the Lord a long time, but has there been a point in your life where you have paused your sanctification process? You have willingly got up off the altar and said, you know what, I look pretty good to my friends to the left and pretty good to the friends to my right, and uh, I, I think I'm, I'm good with you telling me things that I need to give up, Jesus. It is a continual process until you breathe your last breath here on earth. It will constantly be a process of Jesus saving you from the power of your sin. As Jesus continues to purify your heart and our hearts, we need to still be obedient to the things that God is asking us to do. Paul says, I urge you, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, uh, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Note the emphasis on holiness, church. The call for God's people to be holy hasn't changed since the very beginning. Zooming way out and looking at the Bible as a whole, the standards of holiness have not evolved. God's truth was true from the moment it was spoken until the end of time. In Leviticus 19, verse 2, as Moses is receiving the law and the ways to live from the Lord, he instructs Moses to tell the Israelites, God's people, and he says this, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It was the same then, and then Paul here in Romans says, be holy and pleasing to God. And in Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort, every effort, 930, every effort to live and be holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I'm afraid that not many of us can honestly say that we are making every effort to live holy lives for our Lord and Savior. In view of everything that God has set you free from, in view of everything that God has done, the proper response is this. Crawling up on the altar and saying, Jesus, I need your help, but we're going to do this together. Holy living matters. I'm going to kill the sin that has invaded my heart to make room for you. This is the proper response. This is proper worship. And church... We have forsaken, we have given up, we have stopped the pursuit of holiness. Why? There's a a ton of different reasons why, but we need to stop looking at our person to the left or to the right or to your pastors and start looking to the perfect spotless lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and realize that we have fallen so stinking short that the only thing that makes logical sense is for me to offer my life on a daily basis. When are we gonna get serious about the sin that has grown comfortable in our lives and complacent in our lives? When are we gonna get serious about that, church? When are we gonna become the beautiful bride of the church. You know, when when a bride gets engaged, 
It's all about the process of becoming beautiful. I'll have a salad and uh, leave the dressing on the side, please, right? I I need the makeup, I need the hair, I need all of these different things. And there's this process of, of, of beautiful, God is calling his church to be beautiful. A church without spot or wrinkle. Why is it that we have paused the process of sanctification and we have willingly got off the altar and we have stopped listening and obeying to the voice of God? What is it in your life? For some of you, it's painfully obvious what you need to let go of. It's like a giant zit at the end of the nose and everywhere you look, you can just see that zit. And you know exactly right now in this moment. For others of you, You've been on the altar the majority of your life, but you've climbed off, or you're currently on the altar right now, and God is saying, okay, I've got all of this flesh wound, I've got all the mid stuff, but there's something deep, deep within you, and I, I want to have that space for my spirit so that you can be full of me. Holiness matters, and the way that we live our lives matters, and Paul is saying, in view of everything that God has done, This is a proper response. Holiness matters for a lot of reasons, but the first is that it pleases God. When God created us and we were walking with him in the the garden, we were holy, we were pure, we were untainted. It's the way that God intends us to live. And there is nothing more that God wants than for us to be able to have him live inside of us and abide deeply and intimately in our hearts. That's why he sent his son Jesus, because sin separated us from him. Sin left no room in our hearts for more of his perfect spirit, and that's why he sent Jesus. And it breaks God's heart when we allow moral filth to remain into our lives and our hearts. The second reason that holy matter, holy living matters is because it affects our testimony. People see God through your life. One of the greatest compliments that uh, I can receive is when I'm talking to someone and whether it's business transactions or, or just building a relationship and they don't know me from Adam, right? And eventually in the relationship or in the conversation, it says, well, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm a pastor. And they say, oh, that makes a lot of sense just in our interactions. That makes a lot of sense. I can see that. That's, that's one of my greatest compliments that I can receive. Why? Because I realize in that moment that they have seen God's holiness through my life, through my interactions, through my patience with them, through my kindness with them, through my gentleness with them, through the joy that can't be robbed and taken away from me no matter what my circumstance is. They see God in me. Holiness doesn't have to announce itself, church. It will announce itself. How many have ever heard uh, a person say, well, I just feel like I'm really mature. I'm really mature for my age, right? Is that very mature? Does maturity need to announce itself? No. In the same way, holiness doesn't need to announce itself. It will just come up. You live your life in such a way that it's obvious. And, And we don't take this holiness and beat it over people's heads with it and wear it as a badge and we walk around like the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we kind of look down and don't, don't touch me. I don't want to be near you, oh, you sinful people. No, with sinful people, we bring them in in hopes that you smelling and looking and acting like God says, hey, honey, let me help you out. This is how you're supposed to respect yourself. This is where your worth comes from. You are a beloved daughter in Christ Jesus. Here, buddy, you're struggling with alcohol. You smell like weed. Come into my house. I I wanna love you. I wanna show you that there's more to life than trying to find answers at the bottom of of a bottle. I, I, I want to bring you into this holiness, to this joy, to this sanctification. There is more for you in that. And in our holiness, we bring people into the kingdom of God. Just this past Friday, my best friend's wife texted me and asked me what three-in-one trimmer I use. And I'm thinking, okay, weed whacker, edger, what is the third tool? What three-in-one tool is she 
talking about? So I text her, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she's like, no, facial hair trimmer, three-in-one trimmer. <laughs> and I found that funny for a number of reasons. One, I find shaving very annoying. I remember as a child just longing to shave. And uh, I remember one time I was in the shower, I was probably 12, 13 years old, and I was pretending to shave with a razor that was left in, in the shower, and I cut my cheek, and blood is going everywhere, only to later find out that those razors left in the shower for, were for my mom's legs and armpits. And I'm still going to can- counseling uh, about that. So, um, so I find it annoying. And second, like, I found the question a little odd because I didn't know that I came across like a person, like a well-groomed man, right? Like I pretty much just wake up in the morning, I look what pocket t-shirt I've got on top of my clean uh, pile of clothes, I put on a pair of jeans and I put a ball cap on and I call it good and I'm happy, you know? And so she's asking me, what three-in-one trimmer do you use? And I I just said, you know, honestly, I try to avoid anything that is three-in-one. I don't like three-in-one tools because you normally sacrifice like efficiency and doing a job well done on one of those three-in-one tools in one of those areas. How many would are like me and correct? Uh, think correctly and you're like, I would rather have three individual tools that do the job right and do the job well than try to knock it out with one tool. And you say like, just give me three tools, do it right. All the men are like, yep, I, I get it. Is that an excuse to buy more tools? Maybe, I don't know. So let's zoom out one last time and look at the Bible in a big picture. In the Old Testament, there was the temple of God, where the very spirit of God resided. There was the priest who represented God to the world. And then there were the sacrifices that were brought on a continual basis. Now in the New Testament, you and I become this three-in-one multi-functioning person. Where, where today in Romans 12, 1, we realize that we are a living sacrifice, where we live in a continual act of sacrificing ourselves and our desires and our sinfulness. And not just that, we're not just a sacrifice, we become a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2, 9, where we become the representation of God to the rest of the world and the rest of the nations, and we're not just a sacrifice and the priesthood, but, but we actually are the temple of God. Where the very spirit of God resides in our hearts. The problem is that most of us aren't fulfilling those three functions exceptionally well. I personally believe that our effectiveness as being a royal priesthood, as being a representation to God to the world is diminished based upon our willingness to get up on the altar and in partnership kill the sin that lives inside of us. And when we are unwilling to surrender and sacrifice those things, we unknowingly push the spirit of God out of our lives and we leave less and less room for God's spirit to reside in us. Unlike other multi-purpose tools, our three functions work together. And the more we pay attention to one, the more the other improves. And the more we pay attention to the other, the more the other improves. And it begins to work together. And there's this synergy of of working together. But we have become complacent and comfortable in our sins. The moment that you and I get up off of this altar and the Lord has spoken something to me and spoken something to you and said, you know this is wrong, what are you gonna do about it? The moment you ignore the Spirit's voice and the Spirit's prompting is the moment that that partnership is temporarily suspended. Some of you have been coming to church for two, three, five, 10, 15 years, and you are still struggling and carrying the same bondage that you are carried from the day that you first got saved. Because time and time again, we sing a song like, I surrender, I wanna know you more. 
and we sit on the altar and then as soon as God speaks something to, on our end, we say, ah, yeah, that's not for me or I just love that a little bit too much. And what we don't realize is that we can sing songs like, well, I, I, I just want more of you, God. I want more, I, I, just fill me up, God. More of you and less of me. You can sing that all day long. But it means nothing unless you create room for more of him. And the only way to create more room for more of the spirit of God is when you put to death the things that God is asking you to put to death. You put to death your anger. You put to death your selfishness, your rage, your jealousy, your unforgiveness, your bitterness. God can't invade your life in a supernatural way if, if we're constantly getting up off the altar. In front of you, there should be some note cards in the pew. And I'm gonna ask if you're married, if you just rip that note card in half so that there's enough for the 11 a.m. And in the same way it was symbolic to place your hand on that lamb's head and confess our sins, God is gonna to begin to speak something in your heart that you need to kill, that you need to lay down, that you need to surrender. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a TV show. Maybe it's, it's whatever it might be. It, it could look very different based upon where you are with your walk of God. And do not dismiss yourself, 70-year-old, 80-year-old, 90-year-old. There is always more that Christ can do in and through your life if you'll listen. And so in a moment, we're going to sing a song and I'm going to invite people to lay down in a symbolic manner the thing that God is asking you to surrender, to give up. God has been speaking to me. This whole week, God has been revealing things in my life that I need to let go of so that there can be more room for his spirit in my life. So as God continues just to speak, some of you, it's really obvious, otherwise, others of you, you're gonna have to really hear God's voice and press in and hear God's voice. I wanna take just a brief look at verse two of our text where Paul says this, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Later on in Philippians four, verse eight, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Hear me, church. Holy thinking always leads to holy living. Holy thinking leads to holy living. And the only way that we can think in a holy manner is when we begin to purge the different things in our lives and we remove the influences of our thoughts and our actions and we replace them with the very living word of God. Some of you haven't committed to full transformation because you haven't committed to reading the word of God on your own. Sundays is the only time you read the word of God. Wednesdays is the only time you read the word of God and God is saying, look, you wanna have, be transformed, open up my word, renew your mind. There is a mold that the world is trying to press us in and, and, and form us in and Jesus has come and he's taken that mold and he wants to break us free from that mold. He wants to transform our minds. He wants to renew our thinking. What is it that God is speaking to you that you need to lay down? And in partnership with the work of Jesus Christ, 
surrender and leave at the altar. Would you stand with me this morning? Bow your head, close your eyes. We're gonna take just the, the next 20 seconds to silence our hearts and ask God how we can better partner with him and what areas in our life that we need to surrender. What areas would he have us work on in partnership with him? So Jesus, begin to speak to your people and reveal things to us, God. Now just begin to ask in your spirit as he's revealed something to you. What is it, God, that I need to do? What is my work? What, what are you asking me to do to come alongside you and, and complete the work that you're prompting me? Jesus, I pray, God, that you'd continue to speak to us, that we would be a living sacrifice, that we would, we would learn that more of you truly is better. I'm so thankful, God, for your mercy and your grace in view of everything that you've done us, done for us, that while we were sinners, you came to us. While we were dark and clothed in darkness, that you have come and made a way for us. That it's nothing that we can do. It's not by our works. It's, it's nothing um, that, that we are doing on our end, but in response to what you have done, God, we just... We're just so thankful for that. I pray against guilt and shame that those shackles would be broke in the name of Jesus, that we'd be launched forward into to holy living. So God, this week, continue to speak to our hearts that we might live a life that is holy and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Like a rushing wind. We lived through a weird year and probably the weirdest thing for me this year was living through a hurricane in Iowa, derecho. That just blows my mind. That wasn't meant to be a pun, the blowing in the wind, okay? I had this thought as we're reading this that like a rushing wind, like a mighty storm. You know what derecho did? It took all of the dead branches off of these living trees. It took all of these dead things that weren't really rooted, that weren't really secure, and it just wiped it out. When we sing a song like a rushing wind, like a mighty storm, come in and have your way, do you know what you are inviting? You are inviting a Holy Spirit, derecho, into your heart and into your life. Are you ready to pick up the pieces? Are you ready to say, yes, that branch fell and I'm okay with that because now I, every part of me is connected to the living source. So as we sing this, I want that just to be on your mind and on your heart. God, as you come in like a rushing wind, like a mighty storm, would you rid me of my impurities? Would you rid me of all of these weak areas and things that are dead in my life so that I might be fully living and alive in you? I want to know you. Jesus, would that be the cry of our heart, the genuine cry of of our heart. May we not just offer up lip service to you this morning, but may we offer up our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices. And in partnership with your perfect, holy, precious son, Jesus Christ, we would begin to become serious about holy living that is pleasing to you and a testimony to all around us. So Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, purify and enable us to do what you're calling us to do. 
with every head bowed and eye closed. Is there anyone here today that would say, Pastor Austin, for the first time in my life, I want Jesus to enter into my life. I realize that I've been wrong in my ways. I'm repenting, which means I am sorry for what I've done, but I am turning from that path. I'm doing a 180. And you'd say, Jesus, come inside my heart. Save me today. I want to wake up forever with you in heaven. Is there anyone here for the first time that would raise your hand, look up, and make eye contact with me? I want to be able to pray for you. Is there anyone here? Jesus, I thank you for your people. I pray, God, that you would continue to work and purify this body of believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. If you're watching online and you made that decision, send me an email, austin at newhope.church. I'd love to be able to help you in your walk.